Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing COVID's impact on K-12 education and also K-12 education beyond COVID with our special guest, Wendy Loloff cooper CEO of Generation Schools Network in Denver, Colorado, and Paula White, Executive Director of 50CAN New Jersey. And we're going to talk about what 50CAN actually means, uh, Paula. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for joining us and for guiding us through this discussion. Thank you so much for having us. Very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Mark. Great. And and so we wanted to start off with COVID, but we also want to move beyond COVID, right? COVID basically created a real setback across all schools in the United States. It didn't matter whether you were in a red state or a blue state, if you were a rural area or an urban area. It didn't matter whether you were in a charter school, a, a, a private independent school or public school. COVID had a really, really big impact. So let's survey uh, just uh, from your two perspectives uh, what you've experienced, what your people have experienced, and how you've seen the impact of COVID. Where are children now with their families? Wendy, you want to start us on? Sure. So I, our organization comes alongside schools and districts and communities and helps solve challenges. And so it's interesting that I think the challenge that we experience actually parallel the challenge that families and schools were experiencing. And that's that we do, you know, 90 to 100 percent of our work right in the communities alongside um, the staff at the schools there and the community members. And suddenly we were 100 percent online and trying to provide support that way, which was the same thing that schools were experiencing um, as well, whether it was it was K-12 or higher ed. And so I think, um, you know, we all did the best we, we could during that time. And I think there were some really creative things that we saw, community efforts that are to be applauded. Um, we did a lot of work in rural Colorado. And one that I can think of is there was a group of students that were in a, in a valley um, without internet access. And so one of the churches in town assigned classrooms uh, to families that lived in the valley so that they could come in and have internet access. And so it was really wonderful to see some examples of how communities pulled together like that. And then I think on the other hand, you know, we recognize the challenges that came out of it around social, emotional, mental health, about missed opportunities for learning um, that we're still really grappling with. And teacher burnout um, is another challenge that we're facing. You know, one of the things that that we all forget because we have such a short memory of how, how many people died, became severely ill, um, the, the um, real um, lack of knowledge of what was going to transpire on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, that's what your teachers had to deal with. That's what your staffs had to deal with. Paula, what is what is your view from New Jersey? Sure. So, you know, I would echo a lot of what I just heard from Wendy. I mean, it was, you know, just the most jarring thing that we were experiencing collectively. Um, but then also on an individual level, we were being, you know, differentially uh, impacted. And so in the state of New Jersey, um, you know, we we were right next to the epicenter of um, of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic at, I mean, pandemic ra rather at the outset. And so we are right next door to New York City. Many of our residents lit, uh, work, uh, you know, worked in New York City and so on. So there was really a lot of fear and trepidation. And then there was a lot of uh, real casualties occurring. And uh, certainly in our urban centers, we had, you know, students whose uh, family members were on the front lines working and, uh, you know, Know, in contact with other people at a time when the pandemic was hitting so hard. They were not a member um, in many cases of what we call the laptop class and their family members were not able um, to sort of, um, you know, escape some of that face-to-face uh, -face contact. And so what we really realize and understand is that children are very much the canaries in the coal mine, if you will, 
um, for our society. Um, as adults, a lot of times we can kind of, you know, put on a mask and, and, and hide the fears that we're experiencing and all of that. But with children, it really came crashing down quite hard. And I think that that's why we saw so many mental health uh, challenges that are persisting, quite frankly, to this day. And so um, our state was impacted from a, um, you know, a mental health perspective and certainly from an academic perspective as well for a number of uh, different reasons that we can talk about as the as the conversation uh, ensues. Well, you also are talking about a whole range of different impacts, right? You have the physical health issues, right? You have the fear and worry, which has a mental health impact. You have the separation. So there's a social separation now at a very sensitive time for kids. And then you also have the the uh, issues on the uh, economics of states and of families, right? When uh, when parents uh, uh, are out of work for a while in the aftermath, those who have the misfortune of suffering a longer form of COVID, uh, you have uh, those types of impacts. So that all comes back to the school where kids are trying to interact either online or in person. So talk a little bit about what you have experienced, Wendy, now that COVID is done, Hopefully, we will not have another pandemic, or if there is one, we will be so well prepared that we'll be able to deal with it much more expeditiously. Um, in the aftermath of that, what is going on in your schools all across the, the, the uh, uh, Generation Schools Network? And then, Paula, I'd like you to comment as well, because we're trying to turn the page and we're trying to get our kids back on track. How is that uh, unfolding? Yeah. So I think there was this idea after the pandemic that we would all go back to normal, which was how things were before the pandemic. And I think what we back made, theory, right? We were going to snap back. And we're going to snap that, back. That never really happened, right? Mm -hmm. But I think in some ways, um, the culture changed dramatically during that time. I think one of the probably like uncalculated consequences that happened with suddenly open the door to doing schooling in all sorts of different ways was that um, families now want, right, more options that are more personalized to their student. And they know that that's possible, at least in some way. And so they're really trying to still grasp onto that and say, you know, we want more voice and choice. I want a program that um, really supports my student social, emotionally, mentally. And I wanna make sure that there's staff on the campus to support that student. And so um, another impact was social emotional learning, which has been um, a big focus in the field for probably the last 10 years, I think used to be considered kind of like optional or some schools have that and some schools don't. And I, I don't think that would be a safe thing to say right now is that no, my school doesn't have that. I think um, in Colorado in particular, uh, we're seeing lots um, of juvenile gun violence um, and deaths and same with suicide. And so it's just not an option anymore to say, you know, oh, social emotional learning isn't something we focus on, right? That it's, it's actually, actually a core essential. Um, and not only for students, but for teachers and for families who are also absorbing kind of all the trauma that's coming out of the pandemic, right? That's As really interesting. Are, are you seeing that, that social emotional thrust, um, being, uh, greater now, Paula, in New Jersey as well, or or is it more of a snap back kind of thing or some other option? You know, our children are whole human beings. So uh, honestly, it hasn't been a snapback situation for um, our children in the state of New Jersey. You know, in in, in real estate, uh, you know, they say that it's all about location, location, location. Well, when we're talking about children and we're talking about uh, teaching and learning, it's really all about connection, connection, connection. And so that has always been the case. That wasn't, that didn't become the case as a result of the pandemic. So children, feeling connected to the adults, um, you know, in the building, their teachers and other persons who are in the building who are um, contributing to their care and to their learning. That has been really important. Also just feeling safe. So one of the, um, you know, 
there was really um, an assault on our safety was a big issue for COVID-19. Am I literally safe in my own skin, right? You know, am I safe talking to another human being? These were not things that we'd ever contemplated. And so children have been dealing with that. We do know, however, um, you know, those of us um, in child development, we do know that um, having a sense of routine, having a sense of predictability, um, you know, and, and really kind of making sure that that's inculcated and the setting does make a big difference. So I think that those schools where they were able to have, uh, you know, the least interruption of in-person learning, as well as just maintaining those uh, constancies, I think have really made a difference for children. And, you know, we can't gloss it over. It will take time. Some, it'll take more time for some children than others. And, you know, quite frankly, and, and let's also just say there were some children that being not in school was actually helpful for for them um, just because of, uh, you know, some of the personal um, challenges that they faced. Um, but, you know, by and large, we know that children are going to learn best if they are back, you know, um, in person, face to face with the educator. And so the challenge really is just making sure that those uh, settings are as safe as possible. And what that means is let's get back to the business of learning and let's do it in a way that children will be able to feel successful because that's that will build on itself. A huge problem that we have had um, has been chronic absenteeism. And that's partly because, uh, you know, in some schools, we had children that were, you know, they were in school today, and then their parents got a message saying, don't come back tomorrow because there's been an outbreak or, you know, all of these things are in constant flux. And so because of that, um, the, the notion of being absent from school, I think that it's become a little bit more normalized than it was before. And that is problematic because now, um, you know, children, there are more and more children who are being chronically absent. So we've got to get, you know, that um, situation more under control and normalizing being back in school. And so well, you're telling some about- really, some really fascinating things, right? I mean, what you're, what you're both saying from your, from each of your perspectives is that um, COVID and its aftermath have caused us to have to pause. Uh-huh. It's not that there wasn't social emotional learning previously, but maybe it takes a different guise. It wasn't that there wasn't absenteeism uh-huh. uh, previously, but there might have been also some uh, some benefits for for not being in school, right? It wasn't that there wasn't homeschooling and home education uh, sometimes in concert with with the school system. But it might take a different uh, view. It wasn't that parents didn't have control previously. But now parents might have different needs. So everybody's kind of taking this opportunity. The way I'm hearing it is to look at this this education system that we have and re reconsider it. Uh, Paula, since since 50 Can is an advocacy organization, please describe uh, your work. How does that affect your advocacy? Is your advocacy what you're advocating for changed in a post COVID world? So we've really been a forward thinking organization, I'm proud to say. So I wouldn't say so much it's changed, but it's certainly intensified how we're thinking about things. Um, 50 Can Can really start uh, stands for a, a campaign for achievement now and really um, wanting to make sure that every child has access to a high quality education, uh, regardless of any demographic markers or you know where they live or anything else about them. And so that's always been um, our mission and what we concern ourselves with. One of the things that we have highlighted um, with uh, our 50 Can Network is that although we all went through a rough patch, if you will, you know, globally and as a community, adults and children and everyone else, is that um, you know the achievement of children did not um, were, was not affected un- um, uniformly. So children who were already sort of languishing or on the cusp of proficiency, that their achievement has dropped. Um, precipitously, um, in contrast to students who were already on an upward um, or positive trajectory of learning, they were able to withstand um, some of the blows of, uh, you know, the flux and, and being in and out of school and all, um, all sorts of different. Well, that's things. fascinating. Let me pause there and check in with Wendy. Wendy, are you finding the same thing that, that the uh, young people who were challenged before actually were more severely proportionally impacted than those kids who were like like what paul said those kids who were on the upward trajectory 
Yes, we're definitely seeing that um, in Colorado and other places we work in the country as well. So um, students that are migrant students that already had transition, this really exacerbated the level of transition. Um, students who are engaged with the justice system, um, students who are second language learners. I think all of the things that happened during COVID, students with disabilities made it more difficult for them to access services and more unpredictable. And that was just not something that was helpful for them at the place that they were. And so we are really needing to make um, significant investments in making sure we close gaps for those students. So if you both can identify those groups, right? English as a second language, uh, new immigrants, uh, people with disabilities, people who might have dyslexia or might uh, have have uh, be a little bit behind in reading and those kinds of things. Okay. Does that mean that since you can identify the, the discrete groups, that school districts are reallocating their limited resources to help those who need help most? In other words, are they adjusting their budgeting and their resource allocation? Or is it just sort of business as usual and, you know, you just do the best you can with what you've got and if people are left behind, they're left behind. Paula, what are you saying? Uh, you know, we are seeing some bright spots with certain districts where they're saying, let us think about um, a bit of a reset that will uh, really create an infrastructure so that children will be more resilient um, academically, um, you know, in the face of any unforeseen challenges. And so, for example, you know, we've got a district here in the state, Passaic, um, uh, uh, the Passaic School District. And what they're doing is they're looking at their literacy infrastructure and they're saying, OK, let us make sure that our children have the best grounding in literacy because, um, you know, in reading, there's something called the Matthew effect which says that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, meaning that if you're already in a certain place, that momentum will build. And so they're saying, we want to make sure that our children as proficient as possible in reading so that um, they can kind of take the baton and run with it um, more aptly themselves. So I do think that school districts are thinking about how to zero in on sort of the biggest bang for their working buck, if you will, um, you know, in the best interest of our children. I love that point because what you're basically saying, and, and Wendy, I'd like to check in with the approach that, that you're seeing in Colorado. What you're basically saying is that you can do an analysis of where need is, and then you can actually go back to some first principles. You know the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? That's you right. can't spell arithmetic, but you know. <laughs> but but uh, you're, you're going back to some principles that we all know, those fundamental skills that allow you to take off. Wendy, are you seeing a, a shift toward, as Paula is describing, this idea of, first of all, doing the analysis, seeing where the need is, and then saying, okay, our job is to provide the schools so that people are equipped to take off. And let's get to the fundamentals where, where that investment needs to, needs to take place. Are you seeing that too in Colorado? We definitely are. And, and, and one kind of uh, antidotal uh, evidence of this is that we have actually a guide for doing that kind of data analysis on our website. And it's just been downloaded <laughs> that prolifically since, um, since the pandemic, because I think people are doing act exactly that and, I, that. and I think even districts that whose students were achieving fairly well um, before are seeing some of those same effects that they haven't had to address in the past. And so they're doing things like high impact tutoring and um, really getting clear on their multi-tiered system of support and what support students are receiving. And so I think we're definitely seeing that as well as um, just a greater commitment to inclusion overall, which I really appreciate. So an example of that would be uh, we do an entrepreneurship fair out in Northeast Colorado uh, for about 100 kids every year. And this year, they're going to be adding an adaptive category um, and individualized coaching for students um, who are differently able that want to participate. So adaptive is for kids that might have different uh, attributes. So there might be a hearing issue. There might be a seeing issue. Mm -hmm. There might be an issue with encoding language, right? So dyslexia uh, might, mm -hmm. might, might come into it. There could be all sorts of different adaptions, right? And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that that child 
isn't able, they're just able right. in a different way, right? So you're yeah. you're talking about mm-hmm. giving that that child the tools so that they can navigate, right? Mm-hmm. And opportunities that just weren't necessarily accessible before. Are you seeing, Paula, a, a change in the definition, right? When I was growing up, the pejoratives of anybody who was different are, were just astounding. And we still see um, fragments of that in today's language. Are you seeing a, a new consciousness that is arising um, currently? I am. Um, and, and I'm so happy to be able to say that, uh, you know, we we recognize that climate and culture in our schools makes a huge difference. And I think that there's so many educators who are really who have really been working for so long to say, um, you know, how do we create community in schools? And so I think that that has been impactful. And I also think that just heightened awareness. Right. So a, a student being dyslexic has nothing to do with their intelligence. It has to do with processing. And I think that just understanding that, you know, children can hold their head up high, you know, um, with differences and say, you know, my brain is really unique. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, so I think that there's, there, there is less in stigma. It certainly has not gone away. Um, you know, the various ways, um, you know, in which we either have, um, inborn attributes or even, uh, you know, other, other features, like if you're an English learner, for example. Um, and I think that we are getting to a greater acceptance, but I really have to give, um, you know, our educators, um, accolades for that, because I think that has not been incidental. I think it's been very intentional and we are seeing um, the fruits of that labor from our um, incredible educators in the state of New Jersey. Let's let's inflect for this last part of the of the discussion to those educators. Um, it is really distressing to watch how educators are treated. And it, this has been a long-standing issue, but it's become so negative in recent years. Um, I'd like to talk about how we change that fact, right? Educators are not compensated anywhere near the value that they contribute to society and to strengthening the United States. That's always been true. But I'm talking uh, mostly about the the attacks, right? Parents who care about their kids using that that caring as a justification for really some at times really terrible behavior, right? This whole idea of of forcing um, uh, um, educators to teach only in one way when they're standing in front of a class and they see all the individuals out there and they see their needs and then being able to uh, not being able to uh, have a message that is relevant to each of those those children. How are you in your various states and the various uh, parts of your states uh, seeing this? How are how are you, how are your educators doing, Paula? Yes, um, you know, I would say that educators are challenged every day to deal with, um, you know, what's presented before them. You know, in all fairness, um, one of the things that we care about at 50 Can, um, you know, is evidence um, based um, outcomes. And so we do lean towards, uh, you know, teaching strategies and, and, and all of the kinds of infrastructure where students are most likely to be successful. And so we think that that is important, right? And that that trumps everything else. Um, but I will also say that when it comes to, you know, children and when it comes to, uh, you know, what happens to our children, that people, we tend to get a little bit, you know, overly emotional at times, arguably. And um, so we see that with uh, parents and school boards and so on. And that is not to make excuses for that type of behavior, because it is inexcusable, um, you know, when it gets to a certain threshold. But we do understand, you know, that emotions run high when it comes to our children. And I think that what we really have to work on is uh, trusting and respecting the education profession as being just that, a profession. I'm a traditionally trained educator, actually, out of undergrad. And so this is very personal to me. And I think that um, it's important for us to trust it as a profession. And it's important for our profession uh, to really adhere to evidence-based practices so that we can continue um, to earn that trust and we can move forward together. And there needs to be a little bit of politesse, decorum, consideration, right? I mean, just sort of human kind of stuff. I might totally disagree with you, but I, I don't have to be, 
you know, tearing you down, right? Right, Wendy? Yeah, exactly right. Yes, yes. Yeah, getting back to that civil discourse kind of everywhere in society is critical, and that includes the relationship between the school and the family. Um, one thing that I did think do you think the pandemic had an impact on related to the school and the family is before um, family wasn't absolutely necessary to accomplish learning during the day. Well, during the pandemic, family became absolutely necessary to accomplish learning during the day. And what I would say is that that hasn't settled into um, a defined way in which teachers and families work together. And that may be something that we really need to invest in going forward is to, to help cement that. And I think as Paula mentioned, and you mentioned that respect for teachers, adequate pay for teachers is really, really critical. In Colorado, we have a lot of communities because obviously we have resort you know, we have our resort communities where families are working and running the resorts, but their kids can't go to school there and they can't afford to live there. Right. And that that does not aid the education process. And so we are seeing a lot of conversation around the state about teacher housing um, to make sure that they have, you know, a safe roof over their head in the community. But I think all around, if we want our educators um, to really shine, we have to take care of them and make sure that their basic needs are met. And when you have, you know, starting salaries that are barely above poverty wages and there's no place to live, that that cannot happen. You're putting that teacher under so much stress um, even before they ever enter the classroom. Such an important point. Paula, do you want to have the last word in terms of where we need to, your prescription, where we need to be uh, going into the future? Because this is an addressable issue, right? And and our children, children are at stake. Um, Paula, why don't you take us out with with uh, with your uh, prescription? We will sit at your feet and drink of your wisdom. Our mental health as human beings is paramount. Uh, if we're not in a good place mentally, we can't move forward. That said, what we do know from all of the data and statistics is that our academic um, achievement, which ultimately leads to opportunities in life, has a huge impact on our quality of life. Uh, you know, everything from the diseases that we can get to our life expectancy and all of that. So we have to figure out a way to marry paying attention to who children are as human beings with, um, you know, the real nuts and bolts of what constitutes a quality education. And so I think that we've got to walk lockstep with both of those thinking and um all, all of that in mind. And there are places where that is happening. And so we need to call out those bright spots and we need to uphold our educators, but most importantly, not just lip service, support them with what they need, with compensation, with training, with support, so that way they can be successful and we can really fulfill the promise of American society. You you both touched on so many issues here. There was just a New York Times article that correlates level of education to life expectancy across the United States. Okay. So the level of education is is so important in being educated. You we have to take care of the mental and physical health. We have to assure that people with differences can also learn. We have to ensure that um, that we are uh, teaching fundamentals, but also the fundamental of civil discourse like we are having uh, right now so that we can disagree or work through our issues in a civil way. And that you've talked about the continuum between parents and, and teachers. Uh, thank you so much, Wendy Lolov Cooper, CEO of Generation Schools Network in Denver, Colorado, and Paula White, Executive Director of 50 Can in New Jersey. You've really done a tremendous service by sharing a little bit of your world with us. Please thank your staffs. Please thank your boards. Please thank your donors. Please thank your constituents, your teachers, your parents, your students. Thank you so much. Thank you ever so much. Yeah.